Tar? All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Docket Wise uh, seminar, and this is how to market your immigration law firm. I'm James Pittman, co-founder here at Docket Wise, and I have with me John Kosravi and Roman Zelichenko. Uh, let me introduce them. They're, they'll be our two panelists today. So John Kosravi is the managing attorney of JQK Immigration Law Firm, uh, and he focuses on uh, marriage-based green cards, immigra immigrant investors, and applicants with extraordinary abilities. He also teaches immigration law at Pepperdine and Lo Loyola Law Schools. Uh, he trains immigration lawyers through the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, and he's the host of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, now going into its fifth year. Uh, Roman Zelichenko is an immigration lawyer and the co-founder and CEO of the immigration tech startup Laborless and also the founder of Zelichenko Creative, which is a marketing and consulting agency that helps immigration law firms and businesses grow through branding, original content, and LinkedIn coaching. Uh, Roman's theory is that good marketing requires a good story, whether it's on your website, your LinkedIn profile, or doing client conversations. And he leverages a decade of theater experience to tell his own story and help others do the same. So um, I'm going to put on John first. Now, I, how I want to handle the questions is uh, have you when you want to ask a question, I want you to click the button, ask a question at the bottom and post your question. And then we are going to um, upvote the questions. I'm going to ask people to upvote the questions and we're going to be asking the questions in terms of their the number of votes that they get. OK, so having said that, I'm now going to turn it right over to John Kosravi and let's put John on this center screen. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. I want to thank you and Jeremy as well, Dr. Wise team, for hosting this. And Roman, we've, we've done a lot of stuff together. Glad to be on with you again. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm John Kasravi, immigration lawyer in Los Angeles. Uh, and my story, just to put it quickly, is, you know, I was working, I, I started as an immigration attorney working for a solo practice for a guy that started in the 70s. And because of that deep, you know, referral base, we would just get phone calls there daily. And he wouldn't even let us have a website because he said, you know, people are just going to call and waste their time. We have all these referrals coming. And so after working there for two years, I realized I had an itch to do my own thing and do immigration law the way I want to do it. So I set up shop and I quickly realized not a single person was calling me, even though I had a blog and I had a website. And it wasn't as bad because my wife's a lawyer and she was paying the bills. But after three months, she got laid off. And all of a sudden I'm like, I got to learn what to do. <laughs> I got to pay the bills. So from there, I just got every book I could, every video I could that was free because uh, you don't have the money, every AVO training video, anything just like we're doing right here to learn this stuff. And then slowly after two, three months, people started calling in six months. It just became a system that just kept growing. And that system just keeps growing exponentially every day and every month, every year as it goes on. And uh, it's allowed me to have a low volume immigration practice where I only handle a handful of cases each month. And it gives me more time to do the things I want to do, which is be with my family, doing creative stuff, video. And you've probably seen one of my videos just because I post so many videos every day, stuff on all over social media. And just have the lifestyle I want to have without all the headache and not have to deal with the clients I don't want to deal with. That's one of the main reasons I want to have my own firm. And the key to that is having a good marketing system so that uh, you have a constant flow of people coming. And if someone picks up the phone, you're not desperate just to take that case or, or uh, because you need to. You're like, okay, I'll hang up. And as soon as I hang up, someone else is going to call me. Yesterday was a banner day. Like I just nonstop uh, on the phone yesterday. Uh, I think people are realizing USCIS is not closed and, the, and then everything's picking up uh, like it used to. Uh, but, uh, you know, before we move on to ask Roman kind of stuff, I just want to give you an idea of the system that I think about when I think about marketing. And this starts even before what people, uh, you know, usually think about, which is, oh, I got to pay for this ad or this directory site. You really have to back it up and, and know what your system is. And I created a triangle system the way I think about it. And I always go back to that, which is the head of the triangle is education and legal knowledge. Now, there are, everyone knows that the, some of those famous immigration lawyers don't really know what they're doing. They make a lot of money because they have the fame. And that's definitely possible to do that, to market a lot and just sell it and then hand off the case to a paralegal who can mess up the case. But if you want to be a great attorney who has a good reputation and you care for your clients, which most people do, most immigration lawyers do, is to really have a deep knowledge of immigration and continuously learn from that and, and gain knowledge. And then what you do is you share that knowledge. That becomes marketing right there. Every time I learn something every day, and as you all knew, we, every day things change, so we learn new things. How do I share that information? The second leg of this three-leg triangle is uh, service. So doing great service for your clients itself is a marketing system. 
And when you do great service for them, you learn things about the practice that just like every case happens. So that's a feedback loop where you, the more education you have, the better you can help your clients and better service, better service. You get more cases, you learn more, it helps the education. And that then feeds to the marketing aspect, which is well, you do a, you know, get an approval. You post that approval online. People know you're successful. You get a good service. People post a review online. They know that's good. And then once you get towards that marketing angle, then you, you use the tools of social media, which almost all is free. Um, to you know, broadcast your education, knowledge, and your service, and your personality to go out there. And one worry, you know, some people have is there's so many lawyers doing video, there's so many lawyers writing, but no one has your voice. And so someone may see a video of me, and they may see a video of you, and we're saying exactly the same thing word for word. Kind of, I just remember that speech that the president's wife did. That was the same speech as, as <laughs> President Obama's wife was. It could be the same thing. But they may, you know, Google or YouTube might only show your video in your locality, might not show mine. So like you, or they might see me and say, I don't like this guy. He's just, you know, tie is too tight or something like that. But I like this other person. So you put yourself out there. And because the vastness of the online audience, you'll find the people that are going to work with you. And what you find is uh, one of the main things people hear and when I, they say, oh, I only work on referrals and stuff like that. They say, I don't like online sources. What I found is when people find me online, they've done their research on me and they know that they like me. So it's not even a sale. When they come to me, they just want to sign the contract. I have to pull them back because I got to check for inadmissibility or other kind of conflict issues or problems that, that exist. And so they're just really happy to work with you. And the ones that don't work well with you or can't communicate well, they weed themselves out. So that saves you the hassle of having to deal with people you don't want to deal with. And that leads to a happy life, not constantly being in conflict. We have enough conflict with EOIR, USCIS. We don't need to have conflict with our clients. And so it attracts the people who are attracted to you and, and vice versa. And it makes life, you know, really nice. Like just being able to, and I'm at home right now, even before COVID-19, I've worked from home. Uh, it just was simple. You know, I marketing allows you to take cases from across the country. So if you would email me, we do a video call, get the case. It's all mailing stuff, USCIS, uh, for, for my kind of cases. I don't do in-person hearings or anything like that. And it allows me then go play with my kids, go cook some lunch, go in the backyard, you know, take a nap. And that's, you know, my kind of life. Now, Every time I have free time, I like to do new things and, and I'm working on new programs and marketing systems and all that kind of stuff. I was up late last night creating a new funnel on ClickFunnels. Uh, and that's you know overwhelming. And what I've found is uh, when I'm training people on this stuff, I can't overwhelm them. There's so many things you could do. But just start small. Again, know the education that you want to talk about. The focus of your niche wants to be if you want to do marriage cases, if you want to do crimmigration, really hone in on a niche. Great, give great service, and then pick one marketing avenue. Uh, Roman is excellent. I'm sure he's going to talk about LinkedIn, which I've been very successful using that as well. Roman is probably the best on the internet on using LinkedIn. That's a guy to go to, not just immigration lawyers, lawyers in general. Uh, and, and, and just 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 pick one, and then move on from there. I started with YouTube and LinkedIn. I did for a period of time, and it was great because I got to connect uh, with a lot of other people. And it, this leads to another thing: don't always think it's business to consumer. We're always trying to think like, oh, how can I get a new client? But there's business to business relationships as well. And I take the time every week to talk to one to three new immigration attorneys from across the country to get to know them and see what kind of case I can refer to them because I get so many referrals and I can't handle them or I don't feel like handling them. I, I don't want that many cases. And so like yesterday, I was talking to a gentleman, Brian, um, Brian Schmidt. He does J1 uh, waivers only. That's his whole immigration firm is J1 waivers. Like, wow, what an excellent niche he has right there. So I talked to him, immediately referring him a case. And, you know, in the future, he'll remember me in Los Angeles if someone has a USCIS interview or an L1 case that he doesn't feel like doing or doesn't do, he gets sent in my way. But it's really I just connected with him. I found him and I connected on LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. You could use that business to business to create referral networks um, that could feed off that. Uh, and it's an online marketing tool. Don't always just go for the consumer. Think much wider net than that. Um, you know, if you have any questions, we'll go there. Or Roman or, or James, uh, feel free. I don't want to just keep going on. <laughs> Uh, so we, we have uh, one question, which is, uh, how do you differentiate the audience of business clients versus individual clients inside the United States and, and the dimension of being inside the U.S. versus outside the United States? Uh, there is no differentiation. Just put yourself out there uh, and talk about the things you talk about. Uh, and uh, I mean, do you mean uh, me, the people I'm training to do this kind of stuff outside of like an immigration lawyer? Or do you mean how do you find business clients as opposed to consumer? I, I think they're talking about how to find clients. Yeah, you just put it out there. Talk about what you're talking about. What you'll find more and more is people are just using even, you know, I've had a, I had a client who's one of the richest people in the world wanting to get an e-visa for his mistress. And, uh, you know, he, he has all these connections, all these things. 
he just looked online and found me. He probably didn't want to let his people know he was doing this. So he had to search on his own. And, and I came up, watched a video for an e-visa. And so that's it. Just put yourself out there. It'll find its way. And these, these materials are evergreen. So once you have videos that are, it's like buying real estate when it's cheap and it's getting, it gets more expensive over time. I have videos I did five years ago that are still giving dividends. They're still being watched. I have a naturalization uh, interview uh, video I did um, that every, I would say, essentially every month it pays off $1,000. Um, just from if I average it, how much I'm making one video, I average it just from naturalization, a thousand dollars a month, five years now, and that just on repeat. So you have ten of those, you'll make a hundred thousand dollars a year just off these kind of repeat. Now it's not as easy getting these 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 gold uh, you know videos, but if you do a lot of them, if you do a hundred videos, one of them is going to hit it. And right now I have a new system. If you uh, follow me at my 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 YouTube, my law firm YouTube page is JQK Law Firm, and I don't really market towards. Uh, my, my goal isn't to get more clients anymore because it's more about testing different methods uh, because I, I don't want to grow the firm any more than it is. But it's really important that I test everything I do before I recommend it or teach it to my you know, other immigration lawyers or students. Uh, and so right now I'm just blasting the internet full of videos. If you put in my name, you'll see how much content I'm putting out. And it's just fascinating to see how it's there. Some videos get 100 views, some get 20,000 views. It pops up. You never know which one's going to be, but you just put it out there. It doesn't take that much time. If you want to put as much material as I'm putting out, yeah, you'll probably need to eventually grow a team. But before that, um, up until two months ago, I recorded, edited, posted everything. I still don't have any staff in my firm. I do an L1 from beginning to end myself. I do marriage case myself. I handle my own calls myself. I don't even have a secretary. Now, I'm going to eventually change that because there's too many phone calls, but I enjoy doing it all myself. But now that I'm really enjoying the marketing more than everything else, I'm, I'm weeding out a lot of the cases. So I essentially want to take marriage cases that are straightforward, no waivers, uh, no none of that. But uh, it, it's just it's possible. So when it when you just put yourself out there and, and talk about what you know, it's a thing. The uncomfortableness that people have is one is they make them vulnerable because if they're writing something, like oh, Roman's going to talk about this. When you write on LinkedIn, that's to be personal. That's to, that's to attach people. Uh, and, and they have to feel it's not some fake call now call 1-800 immigration law. I can't be fake like that and then video is the same way looking into this little whole camera that I'm looking at it took me a while to do it so don't think you're weird it's an uncomfortable thing if you have a script you're gonna forget your script at least I did and it got to a point where I can't even do a script and every time I have a video planned out that's a five-part video I'm gonna miss one of them because I can't base it on a script because I'll get I'll start talking like a robot but it is what it is you know uh, you put a disclaimer at the bottom and you're good. <laughs> so, so contact the lawyer, results vary. Uh, but get yourself out there. So many things. I just, you know, I hit uh, 11,000 uh, audience on TikTok and I stopped because I got bored of doing it. Um, YouTube, I'm having fun right now. I just hit 1,000 people in about a month and a half and it's, just, it's a new thing. Uh, and just all these media is about to hit 1,000 on Instagram. I just started pushing this stuff. Before, I, I would just do it once in a while and get clients from it. But I'm doing more organized fashion. It, it's all still available because of the... 15 or 20,000 immigration lawyers there are, there's only like a hundred of us that are doing stuff on this. It's really that small still. John, you have another question here. How did you decide on your niche? What role did your personal values play into it? That's such an excellent question. I, I, I want to see who asked that. Uh, it's hundred percent that. So, uh, you know, I, I, we have colleagues here doing all sorts of cases and I don't mean to be negative, but I didn't want to deal with any criminal history. So anyone has a criminal history situation, I sent them to Sabrina Damas. I said, you know, if, if y'all know who Sabrina is, I just say, you do the crim stuff. I don't like, one is studying crim immigration is really hard because they keep changing the rules and these circuit decisions. Uh, but at the same time, I don't feel like dealing with somebody who has criminal history. Uh, I didn't want to go to a place every day. I don't want to show up in court. And I've been to URR, I've done a defensive asylum cases, I've done removal. And the whole area there was like uh, uncomfortable. I didn't want to be there. I'm not a person who likes to go and argue anyway. So like for me, I like to sit back and think about things and write letters and stuff like that. That's my personality. I wanted to be at home and spend time with my family, not be in the car. So my lifestyle uh, dictated uh, what kind of case I would handle. So I narrowed it down to marriage cases that don't need waivers. Because waivers, you got to go and, you know, a 601 waiver, you got to go and, and talk about people's negative aspects of their life, how they're sad and all this kind of stuff. And you all know what 601, we don't have to explain it here. And I said, you know, I, I don't really want to dive in deep into people's problems. I like just helping concierge. Someone's getting married, they're happy. And we get a green card. Someone is investing E2, they're happy, they're starting a business. Um, or someone's an EB1A. I don't even do O1s because O1s is it's so a headache for me. Someone's EB1A, top talent. I'm excited about helping them, and I only handle those. And I have a consultation fee. I weeds out a lot of people, but uh, it's all cases I want to do. There's nothing I do that I don't want to do, and that's what makes it a spectacular experience. 
Awesome. Let me ask you another question. Uh, someone says they're at a full service law firm and not uh, an immigration specific firm. So how do they leverage the other practice areas to boost the immigration practice area? Well, it's not something I specialize in. I don't really like immigration lawyers doing other stuff than immigration other than one side thing. If you're criminal in immigration or maybe family in immigration, but the full service, uh, I'm always like, eh, immigration is such a unique field. I like people just doing immigration. Uh, but they feed into each other. You just talk about how they feed into each other. Like I have a student who uh, does, who is who's quitting his job as an insurance defense. He got tired of defending the insurance companies uh, for for uh, workman's comp and stuff like that on, the, on, the, on their other side or something like that. And I'm like, well, talk videos about how immigrants are affected by workers' comp. For example, I believe in California, and I, I don't know for sure, where if you're in here unlawfully, if you are hurt in the job, you're so could get workman's comp. And so we'll do a hybrid video where you talk about you know, an immigrant who doesn't have status, but talk about workman's comp. And although he doesn't want to do workman's comp anymore, he's like, I don't want to talk about that. I said, just do it because it's going to capture that immigrant audience. And one of them is going to come and have a 245i case. And one of them is going to come and has their child that's 21 now, like a file for them, or maybe do uh, you know all, all the myriad of ways we could do it. But just, just, just talk about how those areas uh, attach and coincide. So you capture both audiences and it feeds off each other and just grow from there. Um, and, and it'll work. I'll feed both areas of your practice. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking a question about the uh, equipment and technology that you use to do your podcast and your other videos. You want to touch on that? Yeah, I've wasted money uh, the, on this a lot. And what I realized is right now, Roman and I and, and, and James were talking about this. I'm looking at my computer. I'm using the mic there. I have a myriad of mics. I've probably spent a thousand dollars in like four or five different mics. They all have certain issues. They sometimes work, sometimes don't. Um, I just make it easy like this. So uh, when I do videos, uh, one of my clients who was so happy gave me like this two thousand dollar camera, and so I use that. But you could just use your phone. That's all you need. Um, and that's that. Uh, keep it simple. And then over time, as you grow, you get more complicated and do these different kinds of things. Uh, but you don't need it. So like right now. I have this camera. It's like a two thousand dollar camera. I have this microphone, uh, shotgun microphone, they call it. But it, it, it's it was probably like eighty bucks or something. Not that big deal. I, you could get a lapel mic. The problem is, I got a lapel mic to do the recording, but I got a ring light. So lighting is important too if you go to a video. Uh, but the the dimmer on the ring light causes the audio and the micro and the lapel microphone to buzz. And it's more technically need to be. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff. I have this mic here. I just took out the stand that I could do. I do my podcast with this now. The sounds a little warmer. But this only lasts like 10 episodes or 20 episodes I've been doing this. I went 110 episodes just talking to, what did I talk to? I think my computer or something like that on my phone. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it's not, it's really cheap. You can get a mic for 10 bucks and use that. The mic will get busted soon, like after like, you know, a couple months, but it's 10 bucks. You get a new one until it works out. Uh, don't worry about technology. Just record it. The one thing that took me a year extra, my podcast would have been on its sixth anniversary right now, but it, taking the recorded podcast and getting on iTunes requires you to copy and paste one thing but i was so i'm a person i want to learn how to do everything myself which is really dumb and i don't recommend doing that uh and i've broken out of that last couple of years which is a key part of my success but i had to figure out on my own how to post it which was just a copy pasting but it took me a year to learn how to get itunes to read my uh, podcast hosting system which is a two second thing so i would just say if you need help just go to a person who could train this kind of stuff pay them whatever it is because that delay of one year had, I probably lost hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of marketing material I could have put out that would have got cases because I just wanted to learn it myself and read it instead of just asking somebody or, or getting a mentor or hiring somebody to teach me. All right, that's great. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna give the floor to Roman to present some of his ideas. And then afterwards, we're gonna field questions for both of you guys. So let's turn it over to Roman. I'm putting you on the screen. There you go. Roman, take it away. Awesome. Um, thank you everybody for, for joining and John for just so, I mean, I just want to say I concur and go on with my day because I'm not sure. Uh, I think you basically covered all of the bases. Um, I mean, I, I'm going to touch on a lot of stuff that you talked about, maybe dive into a little extra things. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about, yeah, so I'm seeing a question here about how to leverage LinkedIn. I will get to that promise. That's sort of my whole spiel. However, I think before you talk, you talk about leveraging LinkedIn and, you know, John, you kind of talked about, about this. I think the most important thing for me and when I work with clients and for myself is just to understand your goals, 
right? So your goals can be dictated by, like John, you said, your lifestyle, right? That your goal is a lifestyle. And so you backed into the way that you practice, you backed into your, into your law firm through your goals. So for me, the number one thing is like, what are your goals? Do you want to grow your business? Do you want to triple it? Do you want to hire 10 people and all that kind of stuff? Do you want to uh, maintain the current size of the business and, you know, do something adjacent to it? Like, um, you know, immigration consulting or something like that? Do you want to just have a bare minimum business and make sure that you can go surf at the end of each day? You know, like whatever it is, figure out what your goals are first. So to me, that's the number one thing. The number two thing is like figure out your interests within immigration. So most people or all people here are immigration lawyers. Um, start off with a niche and really focus on that niche. And it might sound scary, but man, I have talked to and I've seen so many immigration lawyers whose websites are basically like, especially folks who maybe started at a larger firm and then open up their own small shop, everyone and their mother, their website says, you know, big law firm experience with a small law firm touch. And they think that this kind of website copy separates them from other people, but guess what? It doesn't. There are literally thousands of other immigration attorneys that do this kind of work and say this kind of a thing. Um, and it doesn't really separate you. A better way to separate yourself is, for example, by saying there's one immigration lawyer based on California um, and, and she is an esports immigration lawyer. And on the one hand, that sounds so specific, but on the other hand, it is so clear to your target audience that you do this one particular thing, you're really good at it and that they are your target market, that it will actually elevate you in terms of having um, better quality clients come in, having the kind of clients come in that you want to work with and then actually having them convert into clients, right? From prospects into clients. So I feel like for law firms who, you know, you're all probably at different places. Maybe some of you already have a, a niche figured out or maybe you kind of know what you want to do, but many don't, right? And so for, for an individual like that, I always say like, what kind of cases do you love to do? I, John, I love what you talked about in terms of the guy who does um, workers comp and now is going to be an immigration lawyer. Your, from my perspective, your advice is spot on. Start your content by leveraging what you already know as a workers comp lawyer and sort of transitioning that into your immigration practice. So first, why are people gonna come to you? They're not gonna come to you because of your, of your immigration expertise. Well, you don't really know that much about it. You're just getting started. They will, however, come to you because you're a new immigration lawyer with a ton of workers comp expertise, right? And so that's why that video that you were saying, John, for that person to do is like brilliant because you can talk super intelligently about workers comp and then say, hey, I practice immigration law. I leverage my years of workers comp experience to help immigrants who have been hurt on the job get the thing they need to do. Now, again, that might sound scary because it's kind of niche, but there are definitely enough people in that demographic and basically any demographic you can think of to, to support a solo lawyer. And then of course that success and that income that comes in will then give you the sort of leverage to expand into other places, to hire somebody, to buy an expensive camera if that's what you want to do, et cetera. Like first you need to establish yourself in some niche. So I think like figuring out your goals, what you want to do with it, with your career and with your life, um, and then sort of marrying that with what you're passionate about, what you know a lot about. Um, it could even be something that's not immigration related, right? Like we said, workers comp and how you leverage that into your immigration practice. Those are to me like the pillars of what you do with, in terms of marketing. Now, how does this, how do you leverage LinkedIn? This question from Aaron. Um, I mean, LinkedIn is a social media platform. LinkedIn is essentially Facebook where everybody is a little bit more respectful. There are fewer people on there. Um, and then also there's just different type of content that comes out. Um, on Facebook, we're all used to sharing our lives, maybe our political opinions, maybe our lunch that we had, a vacation that we took. LinkedIn is not set up to be that way. Um, but it is inherently a social media platform. And so, I mean, this could be, this, this kind of question could be answered with a very long uh, answer, but the short answer of it is utilize what you know and what you do to educate people about your expertise and draw them in via your content, right? So put out, con put out posts, put out videos, put out other things that you can, you know, other types of content via LinkedIn to just educate people, right? You want to become a sort of an influencer or a micro influencer, if you will. So for example, there have been a lot of immigration lawyers who have been like, how to use YouTube. They come to me because they know me because of LinkedIn stuff. 
And I'm like, go to John. I'm not the expert on YouTube. Go to John. John is the absolute expert on YouTube, particularly for immigration lawyers. Now, how do I know that? It's because John A talks about YouTube and B puts out a ton of videos through YouTube and posts them on Facebook, posts them on LinkedIn. And so that signals to me sometimes um, uh, consciously, sometimes subconsciously that this person is an expert on YouTube, right? So just from that perspective, be that person, be the person who is an expert in a certain field. Um, and so that's the kind of content that you put out. Now, on top of that, you want to have a really clear profile. So for example, if you post something that's um, about workers comp and how that affects immigration law, and I see the post and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And let me click on this person's profile. I then read through their profile and I need to be clear as to what they do and what service they provide. So here's a quick tip for you all who maybe run small law firms. The headline that is underneath your firm, underneath your name rather, right? Your, your LinkedIn profile at the very top. It's a banner image, it's your face, it's your name, and then it's a little headline, what they call a headline underneath. A lot of people write founder of XYZ law firm, right? So for me, for example, it would be founder of immigra Roman Zelchenko immigration law firm. That doesn't help you. So it does the bare minimum of telling people you're an immigration lawyer, but then you become you get into the rat race of like, well, how do you get people into your profile? How do people know you? Instead, what you should do is clearly articulate your value to those people. So for example, if you're a former um, workers comp lawyer and you are now gonna be practicing immigration law and you wanna start out with helping immigrants file for workers comp related stuff or, or anything but relating those two topics, you can say former workers comp lawyer helping immigrants file for X, right? Whatever it is, whatever result you get for them. Now that is super duper clear. And it also does still say that you're an immigration lawyer, except it does, it does that by also explaining specifically what you do. And that niche is what will attract people to you. The clients you're going to get are going to be people who are exactly the clients that you want. So start with that, right? And if you're lost right now and you have a practice and you've been practicing for 10, 15 years and you've been doing like I do E's and I do H's and you know, it kind of ebbs and flows with like whatever's happening in your life. If you wanna take control of the type of inbound leads you, you get, be very clear by your advert marketing and your, um, your branding what type of clients you want and those type of clients will come in uh, to you. So. You know, I, I hope, Aaron, that answers your question. It kind of goes to the first point I wanted to cover in terms of um, having a niche brand uh, and at least leading with that. You know, you can always grow, right? If you're if you're a niche lawyer, immigration lawyer, and you have a two, $3 million a year business, number one, amazing, congratulations. Number two, if you wanna branch out, you now have a, the leverage of working with people. Maybe you brought someone in a workers comp immigration case, but then they need um, naturalization, right? Eventually, or maybe they get married, they do spousal work. Um, or maybe their boss, who is a construction person or whatever, a real estate owner is from another country and they want to come in with an E2 visa, you're still embedded into some sort of foundational um, community via the original work that you did. They will continue to come to you for immigration work. Um, so you can hold on to that brand or maybe you can expand your brand, but you need to have a solid foundation. So to me, like, that's sort of where um, a niche comes in. I, I see that there are a bunch of questions and I don't know if they're all coming into me, but I'm gonna stop because obviously I can keep going. Um, One comment I wanted to make uh, where you talked about how you describe yourself on LinkedIn. I've, I've lost count how many times I'll, I'll see a lawyer like something and I go read their profiles to who they are, what they do. It'll take me like five minutes just to figure out what kind of practice they have. So they might as well not have a profile when you can't figure out. We're not the mass public where you say well, they're a lawyer and say, okay, that you know, we have specialization. So it's, it make it easy for people to know what you do and how to hire you. If, if I can give a quick tip, and I'm sorry if this upsets anybody here, but I'm from New York and I say it how it is. Um, if your about section, which is like the the profile, like the sort of biography of your profile, if it if it's all if all it says is that you've won Martin, what is it, Martin Hubbardale? I don't even remember because I literally don't pay attention to Martin Dale Hubbard. Martin Dale Hubble. 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 Yeah. So if if you've won that, if you've been Avo top rated. Literally nobody cares, and I say this with the most, with the nicest intention. That will not 
help you get clients. No one is ever going to say, hey, talk to this lawyer. They're AVO rated. Everyone's AVO rated. Everyone who's worth their weight in you know, being a lawyer. Don't put that on there. You have limited space in your LinkedIn profile. There's a limited time that you can capture the attention of someone who's just looking for an attorney. Do not talk about yourself. Talk about how you can help the person who's visiting your profile. This is like the most important thing that you can do. I, I've, I've learned and you know, I, I, I've, I've kind of gone through this with myself um, and, and also I didn't, I mean, I guess James, you introduced me. I don't practice anymore. I used to practice. Now I run an immigration tech startup and I help lawyers with sort of marketing stuff, but it's taken me a long time to figure out how to market too. It's a lot of like self-reflection and, you know, looking at the things I'm putting out and saying, why am I writing this? Why am I telling people how great I am based on some, you know, third party, uh, you know, rating system. Am I doing this because I'm really proud of it. Am I doing this because I haven't had a client in a while and this is like the way I boast? Or am I doing this because I think it really works? You know, like I ask myself a lot of why questions and then I sort of look at, well, okay, if I'm doing this and I'm putting out content that is purely celebratory or like the worst is like, hey, do you need an immigration lawyer? Call XYZ phone number. This is pure sales pitches that you these are like billboards that people drive by on the road and, and don't pay attention to social media has to, like it is so much more powerful than these kind of old sales tactic tactics and it's free because you don't have to pay for billboard ad you don't have to pay for you know uh, a google ad etc you can just put out content make people learn about you through your success right through um things that you've learned so you're educating people on the subject matter um and also just like be a person and and i promise you i promise you people will gravitate you towards you so much more strongly than if you just share an award you've won or something like that i i promise you that it works there's now there's no there's nothing wrong with saying that you've won an award it's wonderful and congratulations the point is that on your linkedin profile where you have limited space in terms of the copy that you can put out don't talk about yourself. Talk about what you can do to help those looking at your profile. That is the thing that is going to get them to, to, to work with you. Roman, let me ask you a question here. Someone posted a question. Any, and I'm going to ask this. Actually, I want this for both of you guys, uh, this question. Any thoughts on getting the rest of a law firm on board with the marketing ideas? Uh, the, the, asker says, the asker says they're the only immigration lawyer in a conservative old school employment defense firm. They do blog posts, but they don't do YouTube or any other social media. Any thoughts on getting them on board? Um, let, let me let me just start with this only because I'm kind of on a roll here, and then John, I'll let you I'll let you uh, take it afterwards. Okay, so notwithstanding the just the practice of having being a, a solo like immigration firm in a big company versus being a standalone lawyer or just at an immigration firm, because uh, you know everyone has their practice for whatever reason they need to have it. I think the best thing you can do to help support your LinkedIn, let's just talk about LinkedIn. If you, the immigration lawyer in a big firm are in a big firm, I think you should leverage that. I think you should be honest with yourself. I think you should be honest with your, um, with your target demographic and sell your value as an immigration lawyer within a big firm. Because think about it. Some people, First of all, you're probably not going to get a lot of individual cases. If you're in a big old school firm, you're probably dealing, I'm assuming, you're dealing with a lot of corporate clients if, you know, if it's a corporate firm. Um, if it's a bigger old school firm that does like family stuff and, and, and criminal uh, uh, and, and litigation, things like that, then you're, maybe you're, your clients are individuals and they have overlapping issues. This is why you've probably been brought into this bigger firm. I think you should be open and honest about that. Don't pretend you're an immigration only firm or don't ignore the fact that you're part of a law firm because that's the thing that differentiates you. And in fact, that might be the thing that attracts someone to you. So for example, if I'm a big, you know, immigration, if I'm an immigration law firm or a small team within a really big corporate firm, I would go out and say something like, there are a lot of immigration lawyers out there and many of them work for solo, you know, for themselves or for um, large immigration law firms. We don't, but this is why that's good. We, this is how we help our clients. We help clients that have immigration um, issues or questions uh, who want to have the benefit of a law firm that, uh, like a, one law firm that does a lot of their work for them, 
right? And so you can say that our, our clients are large corporates. They come to us for their sort of corporate formation. They come to us for their contract stuff. And they also come to the, us for their immigration. This is the value that we provide to them. So talk about the value that you provide vis-a-vis -vis the reality of your practice. So again, if you have people who are in the firm that don't do immigration law, but the immigration piece is important to the business, I think to answer the question, get those folks on LinkedIn. If you're sharing stuff of your own, have them post it, repost it and say, hey, did you know that we also have an immigration? You know, like have the tax partner say, hey, we also do immigration. Have the other partner say, hey, we also do immigration. Just be real, be honest. People can look at your profile and your law firm, uh, um, your law firm website and they will judge, right? So because they will judge, we're all humans, we will come up, come to our own conclusions, precede that judgment by giving them the right information they need to make the decision um, of calling you. Now, I may have interpreted the question a little differently uh, in that how do you get the other people more involved into doing that kind of marketing? There's a problem I have with the firm I work for, the guy didn't wanna make a website even. Uh, and what I realized is, you know, we're looking at this group, it's a couple hundred people, more than a couple thousand people at the very least saw the advertising for this, uh, but only a few relative to that percentage are actually on the call right now on the video. And what I realized is very few lawyers like doing marketing. Uh, they go to law school because they want to think about law and they might want to go to court or something like that. But the idea of marketing or sales is repulsive to them. And so you're, it's going to be very hard for you to get other people on board to do anything marketing, even if it's writing a blog or going to, getting in front of a camera or doing whatever it is, you know, uh, filling out their AVO profile just to get the 10 point or just to get it. It's gonna be extremely difficult to do anything. So only try to do what you can to succeed in this and push it. And if they want to come on your on your ship that's going fast, then do it. If not, they could just stay where they are. Maybe they have a different marketing method. Maybe they like going to churches and talking every Sunday, or they like doing seminars in person, whatever it is they could do. And that's not a bad thing too. I do seminars as well. Uh, but uh, don't try to change anyone's mind about this stuff because it's just a waste of your time. You use that to just push your, your own uh, agenda, personal agenda in, in that sense. It, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, James. No, uh, continue. Why don't you go ahead with the rest? Oh, I, I was going to, I was going to, you know, and, and John, like totally like go market yourself wherever you, you can, right? Like just tell people just need to know who you are if it's church or somewhere else. Um, I, I think on that topic, I wanted to answer um, Beata's question. I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If I didn't, I apologize. Um, about you know running a running a full service firm where your folks have uh, you do a whole bunch of stuff for across immigration um, and and you know how do you market that? Well, there are two tactics tactics you can take. First of all, you can encourage the individual attorneys who focus on removal or asylum or family to market themselves within their niche, right? So remember, with I mean at least with LinkedIn. Um, these are individual profiles. Yes, you might be tied to a, a law firm, but people are connecting to you, the person, and they're watching your content, they're reading your posts. So if you encourage your lawyers to essentially brand themselves, right? You know, it's one of those things of like, if you are, you know, I, I don't remember who said this, but this this quote goes around all the time. It's like, if I empower my employees, like they'll, if I educate them too much, they'll leave. But if I don't educate them, what's the cost of them staying? Something like that. Like on the one hand, if you wrote, if you have a law firm and you're the owner, you shouldn't be the only one marketing. Everyone should be marketing. And lawyers are in a sense entrepreneurial in this, you know, because they can, even as associates, they can bring in cases, right? Um, based on who they know, their network, et cetera. Encourage those lawyers. If it's an asylum lawyer, encourage that lawyer, if they're open to it, to market themselves that way. It's still going to bring clients to your firm. Um, but then you might be thinking, well, if I encourage this person and they're starting to bring in all their clients, they might break off and be their own asylum lawyer. There's always a risk of that. But if you enable this lawyer to be who they want to be, you keep them happy, it's going to be beneficial to both you and them. There's no reason for them to leave. You're enabling them to have this life. Starting a firm is not easy. Starting any business is not easy. Just because you have an influx of cases doesn't mean you could like drop off tomorrow and start your own firm. Don't be worried about that if that's a worry. And I mean, I I'm, I'm, just assuming that because that is a worry people have. Enable those people to essentially be entrepreneurial within your law firm, it will pay off in spades. So I, just from that perspective, from your perspective as the manager of a firm that has multiple different niches essentially, and so in a sense you're a full service firm, um, you can market that, right? Or promote the lawyers who are marketing their niche practice. So if one of your associates is talking and putting out content about asylum, have your content be a celebration of their content. 
And so you're just putting out something that's making them feel good about themselves because you're promoting them. And also it's again, pushing out content that is niche and is informative. Um, but over time, it's like you're doing that for all of your attorneys. So you'll, you'll end up bringing the business back into to the firm. Now, I have one question for John, and I have one question for Roman. Um, John, uh, someone asked about ClickFunnels. What's your experience been like with ClickFunnels? Has it helped? Yeah, you? yeah. You know, I just started using that uh, because it's just the talk of the town. And, and the creator of ClickFunnels, uh, I've read all his books. And they're, they're so good, I have to reread them again because there's too much information in there. My brain couldn't handle reading it just once. Um, so because of that, and, and some colleagues of mine are using it, I'm starting the process of getting into it. I'm clicking all the buttons in the system, learning how it works, how it doesn't work. Uh, so I don't have a, a, a guide to say whether to do it or not. It's good or not. I'm still learning it. And, uh, you know, last night I was up late night learning how to use a software. And it was frustrating. But I just said in my head, if it's this frustrating for me, that means it's frustrating for everybody. And that means less people are going to do it. More people are going to give up. So I got to keep going because there's less competition if I use this. And that's the case. Whenever you're dealing with this technology on how to do it, or you're doing a video and you don't like the way you look or you sound, remember that everyone else feels the same way and everyone else gives up because of that. So it's that's why, uh, you know, I, I keep track of every single immigration lawyer that's on YouTube. I have a bookmark, I have every single one. Again, we do have 10, 15, 20,000 immigration lawyers. There's around 10 people who are hardcore, more than 10,000 subscribers, around 25 people that have between 1,000 and 10,000, and then a smattering of people who have two or 300. And so in a field that's that large, uh, that many lawyers and, and that many clients across the world, uh, really, you know, I, I, get, I individually know everyone who's on YouTube. And so, uh, and you don't have to just go on YouTube, but you can see that people are successful on LinkedIn or people are successful on TikTok or, or Facebook. You, you, could, you could add up these kind of people. Um, it, 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 that's that, yeah. So uh, with regards to go back to your base question, the quick funnel, it's just an additional thing I'm learning. I don't have a full grasp of it yet. But it seems like a tool that's uh, that is it's been very helpful for a lot of different companies outside of, of law, but in law as well. So I'm I'm getting uh, my grasp of it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Roman, someone asked about LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn Live. I see that you posted a comment. Do you want to just tell everyone um, how does LinkedIn determine who they allow to use? Yeah. LinkedIn? Have any insights on that? Yeah, I mean, live right now is just in, still in beta test. Um, I'm thankful that I was approved for it two weeks ago, but I've been applying for literally months. Um, and uh, they're, you know, I think they're just rolling it out and testing it. So not sure how or why they choose. There is an application process. If you Google it, you can you can find the application. You have to kind of you have to kind of explain who you are, like what your deal is, what you want to put out, how often you're going to do it, et cetera. Um, I think there are probably real humans checking these over, looking at the profiles of the people requesting LinkedIn and, and approving or denying it. This is my, we're not denying it really. They're just, they're silent if they don't approve it. Um, I hope that eventually they will make this public for everyone, kind of like Facebook does. Um, and I think YouTube, although John, you, you need a certain amount of followers on YouTube. Is that right to have live or, or not anymore? Mm -hmm. To have live on your phone, you have to have at least a thousand followers. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I, the person who asked, I don't, you know, I haven't checked out your profile. I don't know if you put out content. Just start by putting out written content, start by putting out your own videos. Live is great, but it has its own challenges too. I'm actually doing my first live tomorrow. Um, and, and, you know, I, don't know how it's going to go. It's, you know, LinkedIn is not, it has its bugs. It's really incredible overall, but um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I would focus first on putting out as much content as you can, you know, given the current channels and, um, you know, sort of take it from there. Now, a uh, question for both of you guys. Uh, do either one of you, have you tried uh, using WhatsApp for marketing? Any capacity uh, for that uh, particular application? You know, it's very, very powerful, especially because we deal with the foreign community. I personally don't like typing on my phone. It's just a thing I've always had, like using a keyboard. So the things that require typing on the phone have always been hesitancy. But if I did, WhatsApp would probably be one of the number one places. I have so many people I know who have WhatsApp groups. There's a lot of non-immigration lawyers that put themselves out as immigration experts that have WhatsApp groups of like one to 10,000 people that are getting clients for diversity visa cases, family visa cases, because I find out about these groups. And I have groups that they talk about us, well, which are these NIW kind of groups and stuff. Um, and, I, and so these, a lot of these groups exist. If you feel like being on your phone and type, you're into that, which it seems everyone is except for me, um, then it's very, very powerful to use WhatsApp. It's a great uh, thing that they mentioned. Um, you just got to be into it, develop the group, let people know it's there. Foreign people, especially out Iranian background, Iran, they love using WhatsApp and love texting me on WhatsApp and calling me on WhatsApp, which I always deny and I don't answer. 
Uh, but uh, a lot of these foreign communities, they, they love WhatsApp. So it's definitely something to use. Or, you know, Weibo or whatever these, uh, Russia has its own ones we see on the DSU-60 I'm not familiar with. But whatever it is, they're all good. People are, as long as there's an, as an audience there, um, it it's, 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 could be useful. You just got to use it. Roman, you want to add anything to that one? No, I don't. I have a B2B market, so I don't use WhatsApp okay. for marketing. Uh, we have a question. What are some easy steps that I can begin taking today to incrementally improve my firm's marketing? What yeah, I, I, I love that question. I was actually just going to jump on it if, if you weren't going to call it out. So uh, thank you, James. Um, it depends on where you are today. If you're doing nothing, then it's actually really easy because any tiny little step is already incrementally massive from a marketing standpoint. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends. But I think, you know, going back to what I said initially, um, first figure out how, like you want to lead, first figure out what, again, your goals are and sort of your, your brand is, whether it's this niche thing we talked about or whether it's something else, just figure out what your brand is because that gives you the lens through which your content comes out. I'll give you guys an example because I know that's that's abstract. So I was a, um, I worked at a firm, um, I practiced high volume H1B stuff. I saw an issue. I then started a company called Laborless and we automate um, LCA compliance for H1B, you know, for law firms and for in-house teams. That's what I did. Like I did the LCA process. It was paper heavy. I mean, any of you who here who do H1Bs, it sucks. You know that your clients don't like it. You don't like it. All right. So when I started my company, I knew I had to market. And of course I bootstrapped. So I didn't have a lot of money to like go out and advertise with ALO or whatever else. So I started putting out content via via LinkedIn mostly. Um, and that content was occasional posts. It was like once a month article. Now, the reason it was easy for me to put out articles was because um, I realized that there wasn't a lot about immigration technology just anywhere. Nobody was talking about it really. Nobody was writing about it. There were some companies that had been you know, funded, you know, we all kind of like know them. So maybe somebody like Boundless or something. I mean, docket wise, right? You guys received some funding. You guys had some um, newspaper, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a bit of, of marketing and PR there, but it's just, it's not, you know, you hear about Uber, you hear about like self-driving cars all the time. You hear about, you know, artificial intelligence all the time. There's so many different, there's just not, it wasn't a lot about immigration tech. So I just, that was my, that was my lens right? It's like, I'm in the immigration tech space. Let me just start writing about the immigration tech space. Um, and so my, my, my why sort of my, um, my brand was immigration technology startup. So I started putting out content about that. And then that sort of started compounding. I started seeing more traction. The traction gave me more confidence to put out more stuff and that saw more traction. And then now all of a sudden I'm posting on a daily basis. I'm going to be doing LinkedIn lives. I'm doing webinars about LinkedIn marketing and such. A lot of it was just sort of figuring out what I was comfortable with at first, putting it out there via a specific lens that is based on my business and what I want to sell. And then just sort of seeing how it goes and taking it from there. Um, now, now I put out content ab about, marketing for immigration lawyers. I did not set out to do that. That was a natural byproduct of the fact that I saw success um, with LinkedIn marketing, particularly for my startup. And I you know, am connected with a lot of folks on LinkedIn and I'm watching them put out pretty crappy LinkedIn copy and I reach out to them individually. We talk, I'd spend a lot of time just giving advice and tips. You know, also learning, John, as you said, you put a lot of stuff out partly because you just need to learn the platform more and need to test out tactics. Um, and of course, the byproduct of that is sometimes you get clients from that too. Sometimes a piece of content flops and you're like, okay, why and whatever. Um, so I started doing that more and more. And I realized that was purely because I saw the need for this kind of information for our industry, right? There's a lot of marketing content out there. A lot of the stuff I'm saying, you know, some of it is learned. Other things are just, I've figured it out by reading other stuff. But if you're an immigration lawyer and you're already spending your days focusing on cases, reading about case law, reading about, you know, policy changes, especially now, you're not going to also take three additional hours of your day to read the best marketing books and go to the best marketing conferences, all that kind of stuff. So I'm essentially a filter of that. I've, I've become, and other folks like John as well, were the filter of that information for the immigration industry. So now this is a second sort of avenue of content, but the, the lens was really clear. The lens was I want to help educate immigration professionals on how to market better on LinkedIn and other places, right? So I think I'm saying this as an example of the, the answer to your question 
could be pretty varied, but it'll come to you, the answer will come to you if you figure out what your lens is and what the content should be, then it becomes super easy. So the last thing I'll say is a quick example. If you are a, um, if you're an asylum attorney, for example, and you wanna market yourself as an asylum attorney, uh, what, are you, what are you interested in about asylum? What are some crazy things you've worked on? What are things you've learned? So take that approach and just put that information out on LinkedIn. Your lens then will be of your content. Your lens is educate, educating immigration lawyers on asylum law or maybe even a specific topic within asylum law, right? Something maybe that you've worked on uh, particularly. And, and then the question about how do I market then is just like, what am I writing about today? Like, that's it. What am I sharing today from, from what I already know? That's really the question. So once you can get to that, it becomes super, um, super easy. Practically, I think start off on LinkedIn. If you're doing B2B, I think if you're doing B2C, meaning your clients are individuals, right? Um, probably much more of, many more of them are on Facebook. Um, I mean, depending on the demographic, but a lot more people are on Facebook. So you can start putting out stuff um, on Facebook and, and sort of building your brand that way. However, uh, if you are a family or individual based immigration lawyer, I think putting out content on LinkedIn is great too, because it builds your brand amongst your peers. And then you're more likely to then sit on a webinar, be on an ALA panel, be published somewhere. And that helps the brand as well. Hope that helps. John, what would your ABCs be? Well, you know, it, Roman said it well, is first know who you are and who your audience is. So you're not wasting time talking about this vast community, really just hone it in to know exactly who it is. And then figure out which which platform we like to use. Like we so mentioned WhatsApp, and I don't like typing my phone, so I didn't do that. TikTok is a phone base. The only reason I did that is because I wanted to see if I could do it, but I, I I'm like falling now. I don't even bother posting that much anymore. I just want to test it out. Uh, and you know, LinkedIn is beautiful too. The way it works out, the way I, I, I you know, because I jump around testing things out. I, I, I've been uh, been focusing hard on LinkedIn for a while. But when I did, I'd write these articles and I'll have people like and comment and now read their profiles and now reach out and have phone calls with them. And so that's a different way of doing it. And I remember one of the first people I did that with, I got an E2 case out of it. It was an immigration lawyer in uh, Czech Republic I spoke with. So it's kind of vast, but you gotta see what you like to do. Uh, some people wanna do audio. I mean, the asylum attorney example is great. I've been saying this for years. Someone who's really into asylum should have a podcast where they just talk about country conditions for each country. Every month talk about a different country condition. And people are going to capture that. And then one day you talk about Yemen's country conditions or, or Iran or something like that. And they'll call you and say you're the expert. Uh, but just find out what you want to do. Audio, written, reaching out to people. And this is not all even digital. I mean, in-person kind of stuff. Just just figure out who you want to reach out and what you like to do. Uh, usually writing is the simplest. Uh, when I first started doing videos, uncomfortable being in front of the camera. So I'll do a voiceover and I'll just read over slides. You can do that too. Just figure out what you're comfortable with doing and what has the lowest cost associated with doing it. So for example, video will require lighting for the most part, better audio quality, you're looking for a camera and editing. That may be too far ahead to do something like that, but maybe just talking to a recording or typing something out in LinkedIn, it's just, it's easier. But it's not easy, right? Good copy is not easy and it takes emotional energy and mental energy. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. Roman's like the expert, he does it constantly and he's getting like massive views. So uh, the number one thing is that know who your audience is and then just do it. Do the, the easiest one possible, which might be typing for us as lawyers and talk about what you study. What I did at first and still do is every day when I learn something new with regards to immigration law, I'll do a short video on it. It's like, okay, today F1 student visas, this what happened. Let me just talk about it a little bit. And that, that, it's that easy. The material is out there. Immigration is really easy to write about. One, because there's so much different niches in immigration, like thousands of things we could talk about. And it's on the forefront of news. So it's really, you know, captures attention and keywords and all. So it's really easy to do immigration. Just just be yourself and talk about what's on your mind. Just put what's on your mind on paper, clean it up and put it out there on these different platforms. How, how about this? Uh, someone asked you a question. Do you recommend using the tools that allow you to post content on all of the platforms automatically uh, or post them one by one? Tools like Hootsuite. So can I, because I was going to jump on this now. Okay. I, I thought, John, this is perfect. Let me talk about the, if, if you will, the, um, the written piece, and then maybe you could talk about the video piece because you can stream on both on multiple platforms too. Um, I, 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 I'm pretty, so here's, here's the issue. And I posted about this literally two days ago and I've came across someone today as well. I keep seeing these profiles, even in our industry that have like massive connections. I mean, thousands and in some cases, tens of thousands of connections. And I look at their, it's, it's a quick audit. I do, I, I go to their previous posts and it's like, no, no likes, no comments. Nobody's engaging with them. 
and then I go to their all of their activities. So on LinkedIn, you can see your posts, which you've put out, and then you can see all activity, which also displays what you've liked, what you've commented on, um, et cetera. I've found that the people who have a lot of connections, and also others, but people who have a lot of connections who don't get any um, engagement are people who are either posting, blasting through Hootsuite or, or one of these other platforms, or even if they're putting it out on LinkedIn, they're never going back to follow up with anything. So my theory about doing that is, okay, it is it is easier to do, uh, to go through Hootsuite. I think though, when I see a, when I see copy that looks like a, an Instagram post and you can tell, right, when something is an Instagram post, I mean, even something like calling out a company, if you do at John Kosravi, your, your, your tag on Instagram is different, obviously, from your name on LinkedIn. So if I see the LinkedIn copy and it says like at JQK Law, I don't remember exactly what your Instagram account handle is. Um, uh, I know that that was automatically put on through one of these platforms and the copy was meant for Instagram. And I dismissed that, that piece of content automatically, or I at least um, devalue it in my mind that there's gotta be something real good about it to keep me going. Because here's the thing with social media, it is social. It is not a place, if you wanna use it correctly and if you wanna leverage it effectively, it is not a place for you to just advertise and walk away. It is not a billboard, it is a community. The reason that I have so many views and likes and all this kind of stuff is because I spend time on it. Now, maybe I spend a little more time on it than others do, and I admit that I do, but you can still spend at least some time on it on a daily basis and comment on people's posts. If you post something, make sure that if someone comments, you comment back, right? Like other people's stuff, engage with them. I mean, I think about it, it's like, you know, we've all been going to conferences for many years and, and most people, I mean, I don't want to say most people, but a lot of folks who go to conferences are comfortable in big groups. They're, they're open to communicating effectively, et cetera. They're really social. Like people talk to you, talk back, and then they go online. All of those best practices do not translate. They just put out billboard information and just go away. Think of LinkedIn as a 24 seven um, uh, networking event. If you put out a post about how about country conditions for a certain country, and someone responds with an up with a question, right? Their comment is a question. If you don't respond back to them, they're not going to continue to engage with you. Like imagine in person, you said something, and I was like, John, I think LinkedIn is great. And John's like, Yeah, of course. You know, how do you feel about this? And I walk away. John would be like, Who's this asshole? Like, I just asked you something. Why are you ignoring me? This is effectively psychologically what happens if um, somebody, let's say, comments on your post and you never respond to them. Um, yeah, thank you, Jared. I appreciate that. You know, it's, yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Back to my call for a guy I was doing that and I commented on his YouTube and Facebook, never responded. And uh, I was talking with them as, and I'm like, you know, uh, you're running this mastermind group, uh, you're charging this much money in. You, you could have had me in this group years ago if you had responded. He said, you know, I'm so bad at this, you're right, this and that, uh, and you missed out. So I don't use these services that mass send it out. I haven't found one. It just, I'm not, as much as I use technology, I'm really bad at technology. So, that, that, so uh, but uh, one of the things I've seen is you can't mass blast this kind of stuff. So when I started making massive YouTube content, which I have recently, I was just blast on everywhere. But then I quickly realized I saw people unsubscribing like crazy on Instagram because of the stuff I was posting. And I realized, oh, you can't use the same YouTube video for Instagram. It's a different audience. You can't use the same one for TikTok. You can't use the same one for LinkedIn. And so right now, I post a lot of stuff on the JQK Law Firm LinkedIn page, but on my personal page, I pick and choose, which is where a mass audience is. I pick and choose which ones I will share there. And when I share it there, uh, I, you know, the post that's on JQK Law that has its own description there, I have to then write another description of that description on what I'm posting to be engaging on a personal level then, because that the other one I'm sharing from my law firm is meant for you know commercial purposes for law firm. That if I'm posting on the personal one, I have to be a person there talking about why I individually think it's important. And you know, Roman's great on LinkedIn. Another person you can, you can learn a lot from is a gentleman, he's an immigration lawyer in Minnesota, Bob Weber. Uh, I found his, his post really awesome. I think he's one of the best um, because his always content is interesting. I want to read it. And I, I look forward to going on LinkedIn to see what he's posting. And I don't even think he does it for getting business. I think he has fun just posting this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but Roman, I'm sure you know Bob, and uh, we actually do know Bob. We were uh, yeah. with him, yeah. yeah. So his posts are LinkedIn uh, are, uh, are are awesome. So these are just examples. What I'd like again, I use TikTok a lot. When I, I didn't know how to use it, and I was like one of the first lawyers who jumped on board because I was watching Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V talk about it. But it, it, for six months, I was watching it, and I'm like, I don't understand how to do this. And so eventually, I saw one guy who was a uh, he's a psychologist doing it. 
and I like the way he did it. So I'm like, I'll do like his. So I made my TikTok page um, a, a immigration or format of what the psychologist was doing, not even law related. And I quickly, you know, within two two months, I got 11,000 followers until I, I didn't care anymore. But uh, nonetheless, just see other people are doing it and there's different ways of doing it. Find one that's doing it the way you like it and then just mimic them. There's nothing wrong in, in a market system to mimic people. As long as you give them value out, it's, it's perfectly fine. Standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Do you want to uh, recommend your, your short list? Uh, people have asked about the book, uh, books or other uh, materials that you that you may recommend. Why don't you give us uh, your, your favorites? Ooh, there's a lot. I mean, you know, you got to get, uh, you know, this Russell Brunson book. He has a three-part series. The third one came out. There's Dotcom Secrets. There's uh, Traffic Secrets. And the other one, I forgot what it's called. Uh, but these are really good for understanding how the internet works. Uh, but uh, it's just so I, I read a lot of books. So I kind of lose track of which ones go, which is not. Uh, but, you know, just watch video on YouTube, on TikTok. There's a lot of people who have these one-minute segments I watch a lot, I learn from. Uh, and so just just watch what other people are doing and staying in videos, and you'll soak it up. Watch, follow me. I have, a, I have an immigration or toolbox a training program. And if you sign up for the – you subscribe for a premium service. Every month I talk about exactly what I'm doing marketing and what I learned and did I learn and what succeeded and what did it. Um, this little plug for my program. Uh, but uh, it's hard to say an individual book because I just consume so much. Uh, but yeah, just, just do stuff like this. Come to these kind of programs, see other people. It's all free. You can watch it on, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on YouTube. Just watch what they're doing. Speed up the, the video so it's two times so it's faster to get done. And just you know, pick out nuggets out of it and use it. If, yeah, I mean, they're the same with you. I, I read a ton of books and, and articles and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, you can always just say best. You can Google. Google is your friend. Just Google best practices YouTube videos, and you'll see a bunch of stuff that will be really helpful. People spend a lot of time. You know, we're still immigration sort of professionals at some point. We, like John and I, I'm just, clearly we learn from people whose sole job it is to be marketing experts. And sort of we've distilled a lot of that information into the immigration space. But there are people whose full 100,000% career is around digital marketing or something like that. Um, so you can always find those folks online and, and spend the time. The one book that I think has... When I was reading it, I actually didn't love it, but there's something that stuck with me. And, and since then, I've really come to love it. Well, two. Um, number one is Four Hour Work Week, which is a little kitschy. And I spent, a, I put it off for years because for me, like, if too many people read a book, then it's just like, I don't know, it drives, turns me off for some reason. Um, but the one thing, and this is a stupid, really basic thing, but it's like, get help, use a virtual assistant. That's that to me, that was the biggest takeaway. You can, you don't have, don't outsource everything in your life, but if they're little, you know, if you can audit your process and re recognize that there's some things that are purely administrative that take a lot of time or are inefficient, hire somebody to help you do that. Hire someone to help you draft stuff, hire somebody to help you, you know, go through emails, hire somebody to help you do kind of stupid things. Um, that really helps your day. And that, I know this is not um, maybe about marketing, but I think marketing is like you said john a little creative it does take some mental and emotional energy you need to have the time and space to do that um if you're constantly stressed you are not going to focus on marketing because you have to do stuff you have deadlines you got to respond to meetings try to take some of that stuff off your plate another book though is uh, this book rework it's over there on my tiny little bookshelf i've got more books here but you know that's sort of for the video background um it's called rework and the it's kind of stupid like every three pages is a big picture when i was reading it i was like this is you know, insulting to my intelligence. I want to read something that's more, you know, but I, over time I've realized, no, that book is brilliant because number one, picture's great. We're all, we're all tired at the end of the day. We don't want to read our, you know, business books uh, the same way that we read our case law, right? Like we need our brain to, to, to rest a little bit. Number two, the biggest takeaway from there was, you know, the book is titled Rework. In terms of marketing, I mean, like John said, like, the best thing that you can do is reuse the things you're already doing. I have had so many of my posts be, uh, I have come from emails I've sent to clients. I've had full on articles come from really long emails that I sent to clients, right? Where they're like, hey, what's the breakdown of the regulations? And I, they asked me three questions. I addressed all their questions and I turned that into a QA and a article, just pulled out stuff that was client specific. It took me an hour, but the article itself would have taken me forever if I had to write it from scratch. So take a step back, look about, look, you know, if you're doing a CLE, great. If you, did you take notes, pull four bullets from those notes, P make that a LinkedIn profile, right? Like John said, you, you learn something, turn on your camera and say, this is what I've just learned. Literally, that's it. Doesn't need to be fancy. 
Um, so the rework, I think it, it really kind of drove that point home of like, man, I'm doing all this stuff already. Why aren't I just using it and repurposing it in a way that's uh, practical? And if I can plug something, um, I actually have never done this before because I do, I do a lot of like one-on-one -on -one LinkedIn coaching, but cause I've just had a ton of people reach out and ask, and I just feel bad saying no, and also can't possibly scale myself. I, I'm, I'm going to start doing like a group sort of LinkedIn marketing coaching thing. Um, probably going to have like 10 or 15 people on there and we're going to go through together and, you know, for five or six weeks, talk about how they particularly can leverage LinkedIn. So basically a, I don't know what you would call it, a masterclass or something with this stuff, but in much more detail. Um, I don't have anything cool to send you all, but if that's interesting to anybody here, um, hit me up on LinkedIn and, and we can chat again. It's going to be pretty small. I want to see how it goes, but I think it'll be super valuable. So, um, hopefully that would be helpful too. Uh, for both of you guys, what about um, the question, some question and answer sites like Avo or Justicia? Any value in those? Is it worth spending time on? I don't know, John. You know, when I first saw my firm, I went hard on Avo and was pushing it. And stuff does come, uh, but there's so much better kind of stuff. So if you're spending the time answering questions and, and putting legal knowledge out there, why not take control of it and not give it to a third party site? And so, one example that Roman talked about is refurbishing information. About when I started my own firm, I got this one case where this person, I was denied an I-90 green card renewal for abandonment. They had been outside the U.S. for three years. And I studied all the law that was related to it that said USCIS can't make a finding of abandonment. That's for a court. And I, I won that case. We got the green card within a month later. And I took all that research I did and I just put it on, I made a podcast out of it. And then I had it transcribed uh, and then I put that on my website. And for the last five years, every year I get an I-90 renewal that was denied for abandonment. I use that same stuff, and it's, it's a good case. I charge a couple thousand dollars for it. And so, uh, you know, just put the material out there. I will go to a third party. The people asking sometimes are dumb questions. It gets annoying and frustrating. Some people are way too competitive on it. Uh, it's, it, it just kind of control the information and, and just keep it yourself. I mean, it's not bad. I would do your best to try to get the 10.0 on AVO because it's a – False reading people may have about who you, how you are as an immigration lawyer. So it's not too hard. Learn how to boost your to tempo, you know, just to have it. But I wouldn't kill yourself over it or um, really uh, put too much emphasis answering questions. Avo, Google redid their algorithm about a month or two ago, and Avo got hit really nasty. Where if you do searches for immigration lawyers, that directory site in many times is not coming up on the first page. Uh, there's new directory sites that are coming up. So Avo is probably getting hit really massively right now because of that. And so that's why I wouldn't put as much emphasis on Avo as opposed to just you know being better on Google or something like that. I don't really personally do SEO as much anywhere either because I found SEO clients, people who just click on my website because they're first on Google, are not necessarily the best. I like people who get to know me first and they call me. Um, that that transition to being a client is much smoother and, I, and more pleasurable than people just randomly clicking on my website. John, how, someone asked a question. How do you find podcasts or other, uh, for example, podcasts where you can market yourself uh, by appearing as a guest? Any thoughts on networking to become a, a, an expert? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's great. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I've interviewed Kurzban, uh, the guy who wrote the book Kurzban, for my like 100th or not 101st episode. And a month later, he wrote me a letter saying, thank you. I got clients because of, because of that podcast. So it, it's good. It's definitely do it. The more you just put yourself out, the better it is. Just like this right now, we have uh, you know a couple hundred people here. It's, uh, it's marketing. Uh, one note I want to make: I have a Facebook page for the Immigration Lawyer Toolbox, which I have a lot of uh, free information. A private page. So if you're Immigration Lawyer, let me know. We could add you there. Uh, but uh, you know, with regards to guesting, being on a podcast right now, I have two podcasts. I started my second podcast, and I'm going to do a third one too. So I'm. You got to think about as real estate. Like when we're playing Monopoly, you want to buy up every piece of property, shove everyone else out. So. If you learn the term immigration, eventually three of my icons from my podcast is going to be pushing out a lot of people. Get in while you can. I have to have good content. You got to keep going with it. So I have an immigration lawyers podcast that's uh, you know for business to business, really talking about other immigration lawyers. I have a, a daily live video that I put uh, on the, as a podcast too. And I just started a, a nonprofit foundation called the Migration Foundation, which is to help uh, information about immigration and stuff like that. I'm going to eventually do a podcast series for that. But either be on a guest, start your own podcast. The key is consistency uh, to keep it going. And a couple of people are asking about Facebook groups specifically, uh, using as a marketing tool. I can imagine, but, but uh, both of you guys, both the B to B to B and the B to C, could be useful. Can I can I just say a quick thing about the podcast? If you're just a regular old lawyer, and uh, you know, again, this is not to offend anybody, just a matter of what you what your branding is. 
and you reach out to somebody, unless they're desperate for a guest, um, it's going to help your cause if you already have content, especially if you have content that is that has your voice or, or, or you know, face on it. So video is a good way to do that. Because look, podcast is an audio, it's an audio tool, right? I mean, you, you need to be, you need to sound as convincing and as compelling as you can for it to be pleasurable for people to listen to. If you have any examples of that, it helps you. How do you have examples of that? Put out your content. Um, so my recommendation, I actually did this the other day. I, I saw somebody on a lawyer's podcast. I hit him up and I said, hey, I checked out, I found you from this person. I checked out your posts. I haven't seen you talk about LinkedIn at all. I think I could provide some value to your listeners. You know, like let's, let's chat. Um, and I sent him my profile, I sent him my articles and he really liked it. Um, and so that had, that had helped me. So my recommendation is focus first on creating the brand for yourself. Then it'll be easier for you to sell yourself to, to podcasters. There are a lot of people who are, you know, John, I don't know where you sit, but like a lot of people are booked with guests, especially if their podcast is pretty popular. Um, and, and you need to really uh, stick out and, and be of value to them. And the best way to to sort of convince them of your value is to literally show it to them. So that's just a quick thing I'll say. Start putting out content first. Um, if you already have content, great. Uh, but start putting out content first if you don't have it and then start getting onto podcasts. Yeah, you know, the question is very interesting about Facebook groups. Let's talk about the consumer side. Uh, there are, uh, you know, it takes time to manage that group. So that's, that's a hassle right there. Uh, but you also have to fill it up with people coming to it because they're going to be answering the same, the same question I asked on my live, uh, Q and A I do every day, which is how long is I 45? When are the embassies going to open? When is USA going to open? It's going to drive you crazy. So be prepared for that nonsense. Uh, but what I've seen is the successful groups, uh, kind of attaches to YouTube actually. So those, the top 10 groups, maybe the top five uh, people on YouTube, which could be, uh, I can name them, uh, there's Hackett, there's uh, Seth Puchnik, there's um, the number one, there's five, five people who are really uh, have the most uh, the views. They all create their Facebook page. So they funnel the YouTube audience to that Facebook group as a secondary place and then close them as clients. So that's what you do there. And that brings me to another point about YouTube and worrying about subscriber count. That subscriber count is fun and it's, it has its own pleasure to it too because you're popular, but it's not important for getting clients. When you start getting 10, 20, 30, 70,000 subscribers, you know that most of them are not people who hire you for immigration. It's random people, people with interest in immigration or pro se are never going to hire you. That's when you translate them to a group to try to upsell them on other things. But even when I had only 500 followers for many years, I would still make money and get clients from YouTube because you have evergreen content. So it's not as much about how many subscribers you have because who's going to subscribe to an immigration thing? They're, they're, you know, your, your, your client is going to, the case is going to end after a year, you know, so why subscribe to a page? Uh, but you do watch one video. So I have a video when they change the National Interest Waiver Matt or Donna Star standard, they NISD and Donna Star. I created a video just breaking down what, what the changes are. And that is a thing that gets views. It didn't give me many subscribers, but it gets views where people contact me based on that. So uh, the group itself, it's good if you have the time and patience to manage it because it's a living organism. That, what, what Roman said a while ago is, is really important. Each of these are living organisms and you have to feed them properly. You can't just post them there and let it sit. It's going to die. So if you have a group, you have to constantly engage in it. Like I have a, a business to business group, about Immigration Arts Toolbox Facebook page. I'm daily posting stuff in there and active and liking and commenting. A lot of colleagues have made these pages. They fall off and the group kind of dies. It needs energy constantly being inputted in there. That comes from you. Maybe later you get additional admins, you get in people more engaged, which is more and more happening. But unless you're going to spend the time to engage in that group and keep it alive in some way, it's not worth doing um, unless you're really into it again. You can put that, do that. The, the, I'll add on to that to say, um, you know, one thing that I did and some of you other folks can consider doing, um, I created a Slack community. And that is my version of a, of a um, I know some of the folks who are attending right now are from there. And it is, it's not a face, you know, it's a separate app. It's not Facebook, it's not LinkedIn, et cetera. It's a Slack channel. But I found that even though it's separate and it technically you have to go to it um, on, on your own, um, there are great benefits in terms of like sharing files and searching through text and all that kind of stuff. There's also another, that's, so that's Slack. I'm sure folks are hearing about Slack now more and more. There's also a company called Discord which is also an environment where you can create a community. Um, so think about that outside the box too. Uh, I mean, think about it uh, Think about it from an outside the box perspective. I, I don't know how to say that the right way. Uh, you know, you can create a community that maybe uh, is, is aligned with how you work, what kind of thing you do, um, et cetera. So just a thought.
doesn't have to just be on Facebook. Facebook's powerful, but just the thought that like you can play with other things as well. And just a quick note about Facebook. Uh, Facebook has really gotten into pay to play. So there's not much organic reach there anymore unless you're doing advertising. And learning how to advertise on Facebook is complicated, it's hard. That's another course I'm taking right now, how to do monetize, how to do, you know, do uh, Facebook ads. It's complicated. You might need to hire somebody to help you do that. Um, or, or Instagram was great, in the, and I really didn't take advantage of it while I post it once every couple of weeks and I get a client from it. Ever since November, December, they changed the algorithm where it's pay to play for them too. And I'm not just picking up clients left and right like I used to. So these things change constantly. You got to keep an eye out on them. So if you are interested in doing Facebook, you got to keep in mind, uh, you may have to pay to get it unless you have some other funnel feeding that Facebook page you have or group you have. Like I said, YouTube feeding it because YouTube's organic reach is still um, open as opposed to a lot of these more established players like Facebook and, and you know, LinkedIn is still open as well. LinkedIn is wide open. Uh, that's the thing that people don't realize. It's wide open and a lot of the content on it sucks. When I go on LinkedIn, I'm constantly just uh, unfollowing people so I don't have to see their garbage content that they're putting out. Uh, which is good because then only the best stuff is, remains and stuff. So uh, keep in mind, if you just have to good content, just be thoughtful and, and give value to people and, and that'll solve everything. John, do you think uh, TikTok for business is taking off? What do you think about TikTok? Well, for business clients, I don't know. I, uh, TikTok has clients, but people would call me as removal cases. We have VAWA cases, U visas, T visas, uh, all the things I don't do. So that that's why I stopped posting what main thing is you have to use your phone and you have to type in your phone which I hate doing but what I then did is once I built an audience of 11,500 right now uh, and I haven't posted really in a month or so so it's really easy to gain an audience if, if you do it right uh, but now that I have an audience I do a daily live video every weekday that is and uh, there's always around 30 people asking questions so for half an hour is non-stop question 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 and uh, that has uh, started to develop into clientele a lot of family cases fiance visas marriage visas consultations people wanted to check what their lawyers are doing stuff right all that kind of stuff and i charge consultation fee uh so uh it is good and then that content gets refurbished so the whole video goes on youtube uh if someone asks a good question usually there's two or three good questions in there they become two to three minute clips that could then go on other areas on instagram or on thing once i start doing this the amount of content exponentially went up and that's when i had to get a team to help me uh, but you don't have to do it that big to start. You can just talk to your phone on TikTok, do it, especially if you're doing humanitarian or removal kind of cases. There's a vast audience for that, uh, for those kind of cases there. Eventually, TikTok, when people are going to understand how awesome TikTok is, even though it's potentially Chinese Communist Party and all that this stuff, but uh, once people realize how, how greatly designed the app is and how, like, um, I, I, hate, I, don't like, I don't like using social media myself. I only produce. I don't like to consume it. But if there's one app that I would use to consume material would be TikTok. I have the people I follow and I learned so much from it. I, I probably should use the app more because there's so much good content that teaches me how to be a better marketer, a better person, better everything, better father, all this kind of stuff that's on there. That's it's a spectacular application. If I can make a couple of notes about TikTok, number one, India banned it along with a bunch of other um, China based apps. So yeah, exactly, Clayton. So um, there, there may be issues about, there are serious privacy concerns with regard to TikTok. I've done a little bit of research on it, nothing too crazy. So, um, but I think to the other point, the question that Aaron asked, which is I thought TikTok was for posting silly videos. It started that way. I, as far as I understand, the majority of the demographic on TikTok are still essentially younger, like teenagers, like older teenagers. Obviously, this is how it works. You have a social media platform, like think about Facebook and start off as college kid for college kids. It actually, actually, you could only use it with a college address. Um, and then eventually they started letting, I remember they let like high school kids in or something with a regular email address. And I remember I was in college and I'm like, what the hell? This is supposed to be our place. Like this is our, this is our space on the internet. Eventually it opened up to everyone and it became a place where um, everyone was posting content. And the reality is that the, that sort of, it, it's become that, and it's a huge. It's a huge company uh, f from that perspective. But this is sort of what had necess has necessitated something like Snapchat, something like TikTok. Uh, the the sort of younger demographic want to um, you know experiment. They want to do something a little bit different. They want to have their own place. Something Gary V talks about all the time is like if you're seeing what the kids are doing right now get on that immediately. So Aaron, to your question, yes, it is overwhelmingly a lot of silly dance videos. But if you are the one person who is posting some kind of immigration stuff, I mean, maybe make it a little bit more fun, right? So like understand, consume TikTok, understand the context. Same thing with LinkedIn. If you're going to write on LinkedIn, it's not going to be exactly the same thing you're writing on Instagram because the sort of context is a bit different. 
but if you are our understanding of TikTok and like you can make your immigrant, I mean, you know, like Jacob is a perfect example. Sapochnik, I mean, he, I don't know if he's on his call, right? Like he puts out TikTok videos and he just, he still puts out objectively good immigration information, but just the format is a little bit more fun and a little bit more TikTok related. And that gets him a lot of views um, and things like that. So yes, is it a, f a place for silly videos? Kind of, but what, like jump on it, make a silly video about LinkedIn, you'll get 100,000 followers. Maybe a lot of them are teenagers, but you don't know how many of those teenagers are immigrants. You don't know how many of their parents are immigrants and don't know where to go. And now their kid is like, hey, I don't know, but I follow this person who's on, on, on TikTok and they're always talking about immigration, check them out. That's how this stuff works. So, you know, for I think if you're scared of doing something or you think it's like not for you, if you're respectful of the platform, but you put out content that is uh, for your industry, you can win on that. You know, there's a question about who I'm using to study uh, Facebook. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm not mentioning specifics is because I'm, when I'm studying it, I haven't tested it out. And that's one thing I use my firm for. And I made a second law firm as well um, to use for testing this kind of stuff. But there's uh, a person, uh, his, and, and I talked earlier about a video I watched and I commented on stuff and he responded. His name is Christopher Small. He's a uh, estate planning lawyer in, in, in Washington State. And he has a group. It's like a mastermind group. And he also has video series. One of them talks about Facebook. But I haven't used it. I'm not sure if it's even correct or not. I'm still just watching the videos, taking notes. And so if you want, you can give that a shot. He seems like a good guy. He has great, he writes great copy and uh, he's, he has his own group and stuff. So I engage all these groups. There's so many different things you can learn. And for me, I'm learning different things too, because he has a training system and I have training systems. I try to sign up for other people, see what they're doing. The best thing you can do is just copy other people. Again, you know, Roman mentioned Jacob Sapochnik, really one of the best lawyer marketers, not just immigration law in the game is Jacob Sapochnik. He's He's really excellent. He has an Instagram page that's better than everyone. Facebook is bigger than everyone. TikTok is bigger than everyone. He really jumps on this stuff, studies it as an art. Uh, and so I just just follow what they learn, what these people are doing. He's one of the people like uh, there's a handful of people that I really still get down with doing when it comes to marketing. And he's one of them. And, and John, someone's asked if they're a solo, just a single lawyer, should should they have both a uh, firm YouTube uh, account and a personal YouTube account? And why is it important to, to keep them separate? I mean, uh, I mean, why would I don't know why you'd have a personal YouTube account. I mean, I, I have one I don't use. It. It's just uh, the only reason to have a personal is just so YouTube algorithm sees what you like and gives you those kind of videos to watch. Uh, but if not, I mean, it's just be a business one. Um, you have both. You switch off between the two if you want to watch stuff on your personal account. But have a business account. It's, it's mandatory. Every firm has to have a YouTube page with some videos on it. And someone else is asking about the Facebook algorithms. Is it true that when you post on Facebook, only a certain number of your friends and followers actually get the post? Is there something in Facebook the algorithm that does yeah, that? Yeah, two of them see it. So it's worth, the algorithm says, if you don't give us money, no one's going to see your material. And so <laughs> that's, that's, that's a pay to play game completely on Facebook. Very, very difficult to get natural organic attention to, to what you're doing. There's tricks you could do, like you could join groups, uh, some, and then post within that group if, if, if attention comes. Uh, there's different ways of doing that uh, to, to kind of hack other groups and to do it. You know, if there's a group that talks about a certain topic, you do a video and post it in that group, not to put it in their face and make it look like a sales thing, but share information. They'll follow you back to your page and they can connect with you like that, which is a tactic I've done in the past. I don't even do it Facebook as much anymore, but that's something that's impossible. And, and just just to um, note on that, the LinkedIn algorithm does still give you insane organic reach, insane organic reach. This is why I talk about LinkedIn all the freaking time. Um, get on it now. Facebook used to have organic reach. Instagram used to have organic reach. Twitter had organic reach. They just at some point grew enough and their revenue model was such that they were able to um, generate money from advertising and, and um, they didn't need to feed people all that attention. TikTok is so great because people can go viral. Like you can have a million views from your first video where you have no followers, you have nothing. Like they hook you in. Um, my understanding from TikTok and, you know, John, obviously you can speak to this more intelligently, but this is just, this is hearsay, I guess, from my perspective. People get hooked in at first and then it sort of weans down, but they want to keep getting that high. So they keep putting out content. I suppose if it's good enough, the content will continue to trend. Um, from lit from a LinkedIn perspective, the organic reach is just a uh, free version. Don't go, don't go, don't pay for it. LinkedIn paid version is for people who are looking for jobs or for job, um, like, uh, what are they called? Uh, HRP. Like I clearly haven't worked for anybody for a while. I'm like 
forgetting the words, um, recruiters, right? Like recruiters pay hundreds of dollars a month to have access and they could, you know, they see a lot of data. They see, you know, it, it's like, that's kind of what it is. Um, for content creators, it's still so green. That's why they're only pulling out live now. They're working on Stoya Headhunters. Thank you. Um, that's why, you know, they're pulling out live now. They're they're working on, Insta on LinkedIn stories, which is similar to Instagram stories. I heard that they're piloting this on college campuses. Um, you know, they're, they're still, so maybe in three to five years, I mean, hopefully that, that long, I mean, hopefully not sooner, it'll become Facebook, right? Maybe it will, but for now, the organic reach is insane. Do what you can. The last thing that I'll say is that, and I know that we went over, thank you for everyone who's still here to hang out. I'm con I'm willing to keep chatting, but also people have to get back to work probably. Same same for me, I guess, eventually. Um, and I'm giving you advice right now that I have not taken for myself, um, and I will. Create an email list. Create something that you can have people come to you, and the uh, reach that you have for those people it does not hinge on an algorithm. Because when Facebook changed their algorithm, I think one or two years ago, like, I don't know if you guys know, if you all know um, Humans of New York, right? The, the I mean, I'm sure everybody knows Humans of New York. I was seeing his stuff all the time. I mean, really incredible posts. And when Facebook changed their algorithm, his posts disappeared. And I remember he sent a message that was like, hey, everybody, you know, please follow my page if you don't follow my page, like check out my website. You know, the, the views went down dramatically because at that point, Facebook, however they were um, pushing content, they decided to do it differently. And it dramatically hurt people that had even millions of followers and those followers were seeing their posts. So ultimately, if you're on a platform, if you live on a platform, and again, I am, I'm in the sense preaching to myself because I'm mostly on, on, on LinkedIn and LinkedIn can and probably will change their algorithm, um, which is why it's important to build, build something else, have an email list, you know, like the Slack channel that I have, I control that. I, I it's, you know, community that I own. Slack doesn't, you know, di dictate whether or not someone gets one of the messages. Um, that's just an example. But if you create an email list with even a portion of your um, social media following, it can be really powerful. You can continue to engage with them if like Facebook shuts down or if, you know, whatever they change their LinkedIn changes their algorithm. So just, just a thought there. So quick, quick notes. Yeah. Uh, there are only organic reaches, Facebook and TikTok. So that's where you go for those. Uh, we should have even started with the mail list. It's the most important thing to control your audience. So having a mail list as a law firm is a given. If you don't have it, you're, you're messing up. Go back and add your, your clients' emails. Let them know, you know there's, there's these rules in Europe where you can't add them to list and emails necessarily. But uh, grow that list. The money is in the list. Uh, that, that's just an old saying that's 100% true. And when one thing about TikTok is that, you know, I, the Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, who's been messing up a lot of our cases, came out and said, if you don't want your if you want your information hacked, I use TikTok. Blah, blah, blah. So when I have a second phone, so I, I uninstalled uh, TikTok off my phone that has access to my Dropbox files where I keep my immigration files. I have a, I have a burner phone essentially. My TikTok is on that when I need to go with that, which doesn't have access to anything. It's, it's cheap to have a second phone nowadays. If you're worried about security, which is with some information we have is key, just get a second phone and use that for TikTok. If you're going to try to go off that organic reach that's on there uh, before you know we get crowded out. I'm literally doing this right now. <laughs> I'm deleting TikTok. That's a brilliant idea. Cool. Thank you, John. How about this question? Do either one of you have any recommendations for CRM uh, products? Any CRM systems? I just started using CRM. It was a big failure of mine for not doing it for many years. Because now I have, a, I have an assistant who helps me do it. Uh, but I use the free HubSpot one. It, it's clunky, and the search feature sucks. Uh, eventually, I'll get a better one. But it's just free, and people say it's decent enough. So I'm using that for now. Roman, any thoughts on CRMs? I know you're the B2B guy, but. Um, I'm actually not great with CRM because I have a low volume. I mean, it depends on what you do, but um, I was using Insightly for a while. I don't know, Salesforce is great. It just depends on kind of what you want to do, what your business is. Of course, there's, you know, immigration software companies are can be used as a CRM as well, you know, DocuWise and all those guys. So, um, yeah, I... I uh, don't have a good suggestion for that, unfortunately. Does Dr. Weiss have CRM? Uh, I didn't know that, does it? Uh, I'm not well, going to I usually miss stuff like that, but. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's yeah, yes. we're not, we don't market ourselves as a dedicated CRM, but I mean, definitely um, the process of, of having your contacts, your potential clients uh, coming in, getting their basic contact information, collecting their contact information remotely, creating a consultation matter, and then if they become a client, transitioning to the case matter, can all can all be done on docket wise. I mean, uh, 
and we do have the Zapier integration for those that are using other systems where they can't see, you know, have the context, oh. uh, context sync. But we do have some some capability. There you go. Cool. All right. Uh, if we have any, any more questions, now is the time. Otherwise, it looks like we've answered all the questions. And I do want to thank uh, everyone who's attended the call and uh, both, definitely both of our panelists. It has been extremely uh, educational and edifying. And um, it's just been a fantastic hour and 25 minutes. Um, so it looks like uh, we don't have anyone else. I, I, I want to thank both of you guys again for joining me. Uh, any last comments, John? No, yeah. If you're interested in learning more, join the Facebook group. Go on my mail list. I have a regular weekly and monthly mail list that I could add you on that talks about the changes in immigration law, CLE videos I do on California CLE certified, 20 other states reciprocated, get that kind of stuff. Just email me. That's my, my, just type in John Pestravi. There will be a thousand links to way to contact me. Um, and my name is on the show. So you'll have that. Yeah. Roman, any yeah. uh, comments? Um, Godspeed with, no, I don't know. Um, I just, Ever thank you guys for for being on. Always really interesting. And uh, John, I, I think it's fascinating to me how you and I complement one another in terms of what we do from a marketing standpoint. Um, I'm, I learn a lot from these calls from you. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined. An hour and a half. Appreciate your time. Yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn and and um, find me there. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Godspeed, Patricia. Bye. Find me there. Let's chat. Thanks to everyone and and the recorded and the recording of this presentation will be available and uh, you can check the registration page for the details of that. So thanks very much uh, very much everyone and you have a great rest of the week. Peace.